This is day two of the September 95 seven day retreat in Springwater. Yesterday, we talked about the possibility of a new listening. Not entirely according to expectations, but just being here with insects humming and chirping, breath moving, and words spoken which do not only have an intellectual meaning, but are pointing to something that can be directly seen or listened to, experienced. The word airplane, motor humming, is intelligible as words. But there is also something going on that the words are pointing to. So can one listen for a moment without words? Even though the brain is so heavily conditioned to label everything that is happening. That's its job, that's its function, it has been its learning and teaching. With a lot of rewards since the day we spoke our first word, we were heavily applauded by parents or whoever was around hearing that first word or the first sentence. and asked by eager parents, what is this, what is that? Feeling the expectation to be good and say that word, it was also fun. Maybe a new power felt in a little child by labeling something and maybe even though that object is not there to evoke the image. Same feeling of fun and power when one learns to read. Evoking a whole world just through printed words or written words. And here, unprecedented in our upbringing and education, one is asked whether it's possible to hear without labeling, without knowing. Not all the time, not forever, not in order to be good. But it is a fact that before the word is triggered and connects with remembrances, there is an instant of pure listening. Maybe not pure listening, the way we use that word here, the body, mind, open, undefended, unprotected, but hearing a sound touching the eardrums and whatever, the whole process is electrochemical, neurochemical, and then conducting to the cortex, and connection made with a memory of a word. It takes time before the word is there. It, it doesn't seem this way. What is reported all the time is that it's impossible to hear without the word. 
without knowing. Sometimes people even say the word is there before I hear the play. So we are not at all clear at what is going on due to such heavy conditioning in verbalizing, knowing, labeling, connecting with what this reminds me of. It is like, which is often the essence of poetry, this is like that. The beauty of it, we, we enjoy it. So it's not a question of getting rid of this process. It's impossible to try to get rid of a conditioned process just by wanting it not to be there. Because wanting it not to be there is part of that conditioned process in which we're brought up, in which we're all bathed. No, just... a moment of listening without knowing or a moment of apprehending understanding that the word humming, insects humming is not what's going on or what do those words refer to insects humming and then maybe for a moment listening Maybe the words are humming around, but the, the sound, the listening, the, the, the oneness of that is not the word. So in, in listening to a talk, that's how we started out, maybe in the beginning there may be just trying to, to grapple even, grapple with the intellectual meaning of the words. It may be very un, uncommon to one one hasn't been to this place before. The words that are being used are unfamiliar. The, the brain is trying to sort of get a meaning context for what it is hearing. In the course of a week, one may get more accustomed to the vocabulary, which trying to keep it very simple, down to earth, and yet people tell me that it's difficult in the beginning to get a feel for the words that are being used to attach meaning to them. Of course, often the way one attaches his meaning, the meaning is from what one knows already, whereas here, we're pointing to what's actually happening. The crow, the crow cawing. Seeing that this is labeling, crow cawing, but that caw, caw, caw is not the label. Something that is happening in all simplicity. Because it's relatively easy to hear a crow cawing without established reactions like labeling or liking it or disliking it, being afraid of it. But when it comes to our inner processes of thought arising, memory arising, fear arising, all closely knit together, Can it also be seen as happening, not just drawn into the process of thought and fear and emoting and not liking the feeling and further physical contractions because of dislike of the feeling that was evoked by thought. Not even wanting to see fear or wanting to feel it, to experience it. Because it is, there's already a deep conditioning that there's something to, to leave alone, to not touch, to deny or repress or overlay with something distracting. 
Yeah? Again, we're asking something very radical. Is it possible to listen to a talk in which such things are being addressed as fear arising or anger arising? And what all surrounds the anger, the justification for it, the denial of it, not wanting it, or feeling it's justified to be angry. Having a good reason for it. Because somebody set me up. Crossed my ways, wanted me to do what he wanted to do. Not respecting me for what I am and to notice the, the story running with which the anger, feelings, chemistry is kept going. So in, in hearing talk about this, is it possible to not just understand the words, the logic of them, meaning of them, but to watch fear arising or anger arising or longing, or wanting. The song of wanting. To listen to the body. Not just be engaged with the content of the want. What I want to be, what I want to have. What I want for my life. The constant thinking and picturing what we want, but listen to this whole song of wanting, the physicalness of it, the pain of it, the pleasure of it, the repetitive, repetitiveness of it, and become aware of that, give attention to it without judgment. sounds simple, but it is asking a lot. And it will not even happen, this awareness of the intricacies of wanting all the associated feelings and more thinkings. It will not even happen if one doesn't see any reason for doing it. What's the use? Why do, why do it? Whereas if, if an interest is aroused in what goes on in this human being as a representative of all human beings so caught up in conflict with oneself and each other, if interest arises, what is going on? Can one come directly upon it, not just think about it, but see it happening and unfolding? And maybe have a feeling of importance. I mean that this is important, a feeling that this, there may be some importance in bringing attention and insight to what goes on in oneself then there's energy to see and follow. Who knows for how long, maybe just a momentary insight. Maybe to one's surprise, the awareness has some stability and just flickering on and off. And that comes with time. Maybe without time. So, coming back to uh, where we started. This listening to a talk is not just listening to the meaning of the words, but is an invitation to, to look together at what it is that it's talked about, which are not intellectual topics, but ongoings in human beings like you and me which if not illuminated with attention 
run very blindly, unconsciously, and usually detrimental to our relationship, relationship with each other. Posing the question once more, because it is an important one. Is it possible to listen and look at the same time? Or let the listening be a, an awareness. Not just of the words, but of what is actually happening this moment, beside words being spoken. calling of a bird. Sound of traffic. An all-pervasive humming. And a vibrating body. Vibrating with all kinds of sensations and energy. I don't mean to separate sensation from energy, but non-specific energy, non-localizable. Pains are usually localized. I have a pain in the back, we say, or in the knees, headache. wherever it's felt most. And there's a map instantly available of this body, body image we, we call it, in which the brain, with the help of all kinds of other stimuli, can locate the pain. Yet there too, it's a very worthwhile experiment to question this localizing of pain, which the brain does automatically. It's in my back, my left lower back, or my upper right shoulder, between my eyes. experiment with whether it's possible to let go of the map. The label we talked about earlier, not calling it pain or tension, even though it's very useful in communicating with each other, certainly communicating to a doctor, you couldn't just uh, be silent. go in there and say, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know where it is. I mean, what, what could a doctor do? You have to start communicating with whatever means we have. But here, it's not necessary to keep up that label pain because it is fraught with knowledge, fraught with memory of what pain has been for me in the past, the past including the last moment or the last hour. <coughs> Knowing the, the memory is so readily available for how it usually gets worse before it gets better or it won't get better at all. Or the panicky feeling if one feels one doesn't know enough about it. <clears throat> panicky feeling when faced with something we don't know because there's, there's been a conditioned feeling of security in knowing our pains. And here 
We're asking whether it's possible for moments at a time not to know this thing. And it may not result in panic at all. It may be a relief not to have to know through the word and through the memory what this is, but be in direct touch, which is what happens when the word and the memory and the knowledge move aside, as it were, make, make room for direct experiencing of what is going on. Giving immediate attention. Immediate meaning not mediated through knowledge, through word, memory. But what is this thing? If I don't know it, which is true, we don't know this moment yet, it's happening, but before the word catches up with it, it's already gone. I remember distinctly, memory can be very distinct, I remember the place in the Zendo where I sat in Rochester, when there was this back pain and all the overwhelming knowledge of, oh my God, now here it comes, I won't be able to finish the sashim. Or even a round of sitting, it seemed so overwhelming probably made, very likely made worse by this thought. How am I going to do this? How am I going to survive this? And then it occurred very suddenly, unexpectedly, that maybe I didn't know this thing. Maybe it wasn't what I thought it was. Such an amazingly helpful thought. Maybe it isn't what I think it is. So what is it directly? And to put this all that clearly. But something happened which was a shift from knowing and expecting and fearing to direct, undivided in touchness with what was actually going on. It's a very dramatic shift which has happened to many people and can happen at any time. Propelled out of this world of knowing and remembering and anticipating to simply being here with what's going on. Needless to say, the pain was not the same anymore. Obviously, it's not the same. What we imagine and feel and anticipate and expect and remember is not the same as what is happening freshly, every moment freshly. what is that? And not to be seduced by a question, what is that, to thinking what it is. That's what the brain does, it responds, has responded over eons to this question, what is it, by thinking, picturing, imagining. And here when we say what is it, can the, the brain calm down? It's not needed to picture and imagine because what is, is here. It doesn't need to be imagined. It doesn't need to be thought about because it's revealing itself from moment to moment. So 
So all of this, uh, what I've been talking about yesterday and today, has to do with this new listening, where we already said yesterday, it doesn't just mean with the ear, but a being here. Yeah. We use a lot the word awareness, being aware, but it slightly complicates the matter because the brain wants to know what is this awareness and thinks about it. Is it like this? Is it like that? You can say awareness is the humming, the breathing, sun shining. with no one there wishing it was otherwise. With no resistance. Just a shedding light, a revealing, without a feeling of separation. which happens to human beings because this is our ground, the ground of our being. Somebody brought that up, this question, in, in a meeting. More and more it seems as though awareness is something that's always there, and yet how caught up we get in illusion, delusion, thinking, hoping, believing, all the conditioned reflexes of our living together for centuries and centuries and centuries. And yet, a moment of opening, and there it is, this undivided being. Not being me or you, but humming buzzing, vibrating, breathing. See, when thought tries to get at it again, is it always there? That's not the mode in which this flourishes. It's a thinking mode and wanting to make it permanent for all eternity in thought. Whereas a moment of breathing freely in midst of humming, there's no thought of how long is this going to last. It's just there without time measurement. That's what, what is provided by thinking. I wanted to talk about authority today. I didn't get to it yesterday. I wanted to slip away again because it's so important. It's so important to become more and more aware of this inner demand, it's a conditioned demand like most of it, for authority. The assumption, deeply held assumption that someone else can tell one what to do, what is true, someone else can lead one on a spiritual path, whatever that may be. It, it varies according to the different ideas that are held about it. The 
the demand for authority or the, dema the demand of someone who is in a position to talk due to whatever the circumstances may be, demanding following, demanding obedience, demanding belief in what one says. And going along with this demand for authority or being required to follow, to believe, to obey, together with that the inevitable rebellion against it. When at, wherever we create authority, we also rebel against it. Wherever we demand authority, we have to be wary of rebellion from the followers or by the followers. And here, on a beautiful holiday morning, such a quiet hillside bordered by tree lines. Last night there was a little border of deer walking up the meadow, grazing and looking and twitching the ears and grazing and looking and twitching ears. So on, on this beautiful morning, with no real border lines, the hills don't border us. It's only a manner of speaking. They're there as mostly empty space which is what physics tells us. On this humming, buzzing morning, can we look at this thing of authority and ask whether it's possible to talk together, listen together, question together without any need for slipping into this structure of authority, which means highly aware that it's about to happen or has just happened again when has made authority out of somebody or is rebelling against what somebody said. As though it was imposed, it may not be imposed. So can we, can we relate to each other without authority? This is the question. All these different aspects that have been gone through. aware of a demand for it, wanting to be safe, wanting to be secure, taken care of, and yet not totally swamped by this conditioned reflex which all of us have developed, wanting to be safe, taken care of, through somebody else, which the mind can easily make into an authority. Which does not mean one cannot come here into this hall and listen to a talk. Because the talk is not given in order to indoctrinate the mind with new concepts, new ideas, new dogma or old dogma. The talk is given to look together. Now or later, it may not dawn what is talked about right now. It may dawn at a, at a very unexpected time. But the intention is not to make followers, to feed this kind of inbuilt need, neediness for being authority, creating authority, following authority, rebelling against authority, but rather shed light on all of that in a new way. 
The new way is non-judgmental. Why judge it? If you see what's happening, you don't need to judge it. It's clear. It speaks for itself. It shows itself for what it is. So what is our relationship with each other? We ask that question in every retreat because it's so, such a prevalent question for people. How do I relate to you? What's our relationship with each other? People ask me very often, not just in the first retreat, it keeps coming up. Because we could ask, where does it come from, this question? And will one look? Is one interested in looking? Looking at the inner need, neediness, and fears. And maybe one already has developed images about the person. Is wary of the image, but is the image the person? The image you have of Tony, is that what I am? I used to say in earlier retreats, the relationship is one of friendliness. Let's relate with each other like friends. But somebody may not feel friendly toward me. We associate certain things with friendship. So I don't say that anymore, even though I just said it. <laughs> it occurred to me maybe a better word for, is, for this relationship is one of respect, mutual respect. And it's not grabbing an image and putting it onto what's happening here, but it's looking at what's happening here. I'm looking. How do I meet you? And not just you here, but people in general. It's usually, unless the body is really overwhelmed with some kind of emotion or other, usually there is respect for the so-called other person. Interest. Trying to meet each other further, maybe on a deeper level, but respecting whatever manifests right now. By respect, I don't mean, what is the word that's being used so much, validating it, or not that kind of thing. It's what's there right now. And one may even say that's just the surface foam. There's much more depth to all of us than the surface foam, which are our personal idiosyncrasies, habits, personality, traits, character, as all foam on the bubbles, on the waves. None of that is judged as bad or undesirable. It needn't to be because it's not all we are. And yet it's there, all of us developing, not by our own choice and will and power, all kinds of traits of behavior and reactions and conditioned reflexes. All of us doing that. It's happened to all of us and it is happening constantly. So we respect that, look at it again, freshly not as something insurmountable that's going to keep us separate, but something to be looked at, seen through, and seen deeper into what we really are. A 
aside from all of home. So is, is that possible? Is that a good meeting ground? The meeting ground of mutual respect, even though it may fall down at a moment of anger, calling each other names, which are anything but respectful. But that can drop away if one just sees it as an outburst of colliding conditionings. We can respect each other no matter what the superficial coloring may be. Respect meaning seeing again seeing anew. For the first time. So again, one more mention, what is said is not meant to indoctrinate, but to invite questioning, looking. Meetings are there to, to question further or bring up freshly. Nothing needs to be accepted, nothing needs to be rejected, when we can look anew. We will end here for today.